Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's very special program, The Extraordinary Life of Gosh. His Holiness the Dalai Lama with artist Rima Fujita and Professor Robert Thurman. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, in celebration of His Holiness's 86th birthday. My name is Kristen. I'll be helping to host tonight's program. We'll be getting started momentarily. We just have a few uh, housekeeping notes to go over very quickly. First off, we want to let you know that this program is being recorded and the recording will be sent to you uh, via email soon after the program. Additionally, uh, if you would like to purchase Rima's newly published book, The Extraordinary Life of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, An Illuminated Journey, uh, I'll be putting a link uh, in the chat for you to do so. Um, lastly, uh, we welcome you, uh, if you have questions, to submit them in the chat. Um, we have a lot to, to get to tonight, so if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll hope to get to some of them. Um, and I'll be putting all this information in the chat uh, as well for those just now joining. So with that, I will now hand it over to Beata. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see everybody. I know we're a few minutes late. Um, we were doing a little backroom chatting. Um, but thank you for joining us all. We're so happy to be beginning the celebrations of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's 86th birthday uh, with this, this amazing conversation. Rima Fujita, uh, uh, an acclaimed and experienced artist of children's books in particular, um, who has uh, met with His Holiness several times and uh, will be discussing sort of, you know, the personal ins and outs of making this absolutely gorgeous book with Bob Thurman, the, the uh, incredible president of Tibet House. And uh, I feel kind of like so Davide Letterman needs no introduction. <laughs> so thank you for coming. And uh, I think we'll just get a get moving because we have a lot to cover and we have a lot to celebrate. And, uh, and uh, thank you very much. And information will be in the chat. Okay, so Rima. Oh, 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 hi, hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much, everybody at the Tibet House for organi organizing this. This is amazing. And thank you, Bob. Um, I made this little Buddha for your birthday. Everyone, <laughs> Bob was, Bob's birthday was a couple of days ago, so. Uh, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's a very cute Buddha. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, yes, um, I'm so happy to celebrate His Holiness's 86th birthday today with you, everybody. This is such a wonderful event. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of this book. Uh, I don't know if you all have seen this book. Um, some years ago, um, one of His Holiness's representatives requested me to create a picture book of His Holiness's life story. And I just felt so honored, right? And um, I think this confidant uh, of His Holiness trusted me because I had already created some picture books in Tibetan language for the Tibetan refugee kids. And I had donated hundreds of copies to exile. So helping Tibetan kids education is my passion. While I'm a full-time artist and I make my living by selling my art. Uh, Kristen, could you show the cover, please? Thank you. We don't see the whole thing. Or at least I don't. Oh, one um, moment, please. Yeah, this is the book. There it is, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to show you the cover. It's a wonderful <laughs> book. Thank you. So to create this book, I spent so much time researching. I read all his um, biographies and autobiographies, but I wanted to make this book unique and different from other books, right? So I asked for an audience um, and I had a long interview with His Holiness in 2018 at his residency in Dharamshala. Um, I wanted to focus on his human emotional side um, as a human being. And the secretary told me that I had 15 minutes. And I said, great, 15 <laughs> minutes. It'll be a very thin book. 
I say, hello, how are you? And that's it. <laughs> so I, it was a challenge, but um, his holiness uh, seemed so happy to see me and he made me stay longer and longer and, and, and the tea was served in the middle and then we spent almost one hour. Um, all the secretaries were not too happy about it because there were so many like delegations waiting in the hallway, like some presidents from other countries. And so, uh, but I was in a rush and um, his holiness said, oh, no, 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 stay, stay, finish your tea, don't go yet. So <laughs> it was just so wonderful. And, um, and we, um, so he talked about some uh, about his uh, life uh, in the interview. Some of them I knew, some of them uh, I didn't know. So it's they all went into the book. But also, I want to talk about a little bit about about dreams. I have this really special connection with dreams. So, for example, my work method is a little bit strange. I paint the visions I see in my dreams. In other, in other words, I see my finished paintings in my dreams before I actually paint them. I don't know where the visions come from uh, or these visions come from, but I've been working this way for many, many years. And also my long time engagement with Tibet cause also began in a dream. Many years ago, one night, I was having a dream at night and I heard this voice which said, help Tibet now. <laughs> it was a commanding male voice. voice. And that time I didn't know where, where Tibet was. I, I didn't even know who the Dalai Lama was. Uh, so how, that's, this is how everything started. Um, I get those important messages and uh, through dreams. Um, so I made some Tibetan, uh, I'm, I made some educational books for Tibetan refugee kids. I made some books about compassion, environment, sex education, and women's em empowerment. And um, His Holiness also came into my dream in this early stage of making this book, I was having a challenge and I was struggling. And one night, His Holiness came into my dream and we were talking and laughing. And all of a sudden he looked at me, he took my hand gently and he smiled. And then I woke up. After the dream, things just started to go so smoothly I can't explain why. I don't know. Maybe um, Bob can explain about <laughs> having having his holiness in your dreams. <laughs> so lucky! It's your good luck and good karma. Really? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This whole book is your tremendous good luck and good karma. But when you give me a moment, I will. I'll, I'll say how I see it anyway. When you when you when you're ready. Oh no, I'm ready. I, I like ready. To, yes, so, I like. But, but what I want to say is, it is. I'm so. I was so delighted by this book, Rima. I just want to say, and the way you see His Holiness is so kind. You really bring out His kindness, like even the way you see His face. You know, I have over the years many people have painted like portraits of His Holiness and different things, and they all look different. And uh, Paul Aikman, you know, the famous psychologist who reads people's facial expressions as, a, as his profession, you know, the one from California, he said he'd never seen anybody with such a mobile face emotionally as his holiness. So he looks very different. It isn't really the fault of artists. It's that he looks different to different people, which reminds one of a story. There was a famous story about a Buddha, about Buddha himself, who was painted in his lifetime at the request of his friend, King Bimbisara who wanted to send a picture of him, a portrait of him to his, his friend, the king of Persia, the emperor of Persia, who he didn't want to come to see Buddha in India with his army. <laughs> so uh, the, all the artists couldn't paint the Buddha. They gave up. They were trying to paint. They couldn't paint him. And like they were struggling. 
So then Buddha said, okay, look, I'm going to summon you to come to a certain place in the royal gardens and uh, at a certain date and then come then, and then you'll be able to pay me. And so then he, he, um, he had them come on a very still windless day where he sat on the other side of a pond, you know, like a tank, you know, like those they have in those royal gardens, like a swimming pool, you know. And then they, they could look at the reflection of him in the water with no ripples. And then they could see they could see something to paint, you know. But but you know that's 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 an ancient story like that, really old story, thousands of years old. So, but the thing is that I think we don't have a pond in the case of His Holiness, but different artists bring their own expectations to it. And what you bring, and therefore you are especially honored. I think everyone should know that this book is His Holiness will usually not talk about his life except the occasional anecdote. But to actually sit and narrate himself, his the main things, what he thinks are important in his life, and entrust that to an artist to illustrate in her own way, is just nothing short of, of, of amazing. And it's a great honor and a compliment to you, Rima. Really, it really is beyond. I love it. And he says things that no, no one ever writing about him would ever say. Like, I'm really very lazy. <laughs> he says things like that. He says, oh, I'm so lazy. And he, he makes statements like that. And uh, he isn't, of course, he's a tremendous, he's accomplished a huge amount in his life, but he's, he's, he's just being very frank and very, very simple. And he, you know, I've, I've had a lot to do with him over many years, but I've never seen anyone pick out things about him and his family and his life the way you have. And as he would like, I think, in a, in a short format, so I think this is a classic already. I mean, it just published just now, but it is a complete classic. I just want to say that totally. And it's it's exalting, you know, and also your your restraint. You know, you also remind me of the famous gardener. You know, there was a famous gardener in Kyoto who made a tea house for tea ceremony on a famous hill. And so then all the, you know, the elite, the sort of the connoisseurs, the people were going for the first tea ceremony, like emperor and whoever it was. And and, um, they were wondering how he would place the house and the view, because it was an amazing view. And then he had planted a hedge completely blocking the view all the way up the hill as they came up the special path. And then only when they got to where you rinse your hands, there's a little stream, a little fountain where it comes out. And you sort of rinse your face and your hands before the ceremony. And when you bend down to like touch your face with the water, there was a hole in the hedge. And that's the only place you saw the view. (laughs) So you remind me of that. Like, you know, someone else, but they're doing 60 years in exile. I'm mid 80s now. My body is quite old. And you chose the little nest of little baby birds where he then gets to tell the story about how his bodyguard protect the birds because the monkeys were after the bir- baby birds. You know? and, and, and you pick that and it's so perfect. I mean, it's like, it's, you know, it's a huge surprise. There they are. And that's, and I always say, when I see them, I don't know if Kristen can show these different pages. I don't know if you can, but when you see those birds, you think of you, we think of the, all the people on the planet and we're like little baby birds and, our mouths are open like that, and we are waiting for a pearl of wisdom, or a gesture of kindness, or or something of that so on. Yeah, deep wisdom from His Holiness, you know. So that's that's the human beings now, as the planet is drowning, and the monkeys of the fossil fuel people are wrecking everything, and we're about to go under in with 115 degrees in Portland, Oregon, and this kind of thing. And 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 His Holiness is not giving up, and he's 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 this wellspring of hope, and he's he's he, and yet he doesn't promote himself at all. He insists we have to do something. He can't really do it, and all this kind of thing. And it's, it's just to me, it's just yeah, it's outstanding this, your choice. Right. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. Really? This um, this particular episode of the little birds, mm-hmm. actually, it was the first time ever written publicly because it was told by one of his um, ex-bodyguard 
I uh -huh. heard it personally from him. I so, see. So yes, he, his his holiness never wrote about it. Or nobody else uh, wrote about it. So it was uh, it was a beautiful story, and then, and so I had to put that in the book too. And also, um, when I was having this interview with his holiness uh, in in his residency, I mean, it was one hour long, but. I remember especially the moment when His Holiness talked about Neutron Oracle. Mm -hmm. And in his, um, in his autobiography and other books, he always talks about Neutron Oracle because Neutron Oracle is the one who guided him of to course. escape from Lhasa, yeah. Lhasa Tibet to, to India, right? Yes. But I never heard, this was the first time I heard His Holiness explain how natural oracle's face in that particular moment when he said you must leave tonight uh, for those uh, for those people who don't know the story um, so his holiness was waiting for the cue from natural oracle like when is the best time to leave tibet to flee to india and he waited and he waited for months and months and he asked him every day should I leave now? Should I leave now? And the Eternal Oracle said, no, no, not yet, not yet. And one day he said, you have to leave tonight. And his holiness in the interview said, he still cannot forget the face of Neutron Oracle. He's, he said his face was so sad, but at the same time, it was so intense. Mm -hmm. And he was crying and then the tears literally fell as mm -hmm. a waterfall uh -huh. and when it's I heard that I heard. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and then I I felt so it was so special because my men my men monastery is Nichiren monastery I have a very deep connection with Nichiren mm -hmm. so it was just extra special to hear that story which he never really shared before okay. yeah but, I never heard it I never heard it before Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. First, I, oh, when I first looked at it, I thought, well, "Why is he crying?" You know, I, I thought. Then I read the text, and I realized, "Wow, that's a new revelation." You know? Exactly. So uh, I, I think even in the movie, they didn't show him uh, crying like like that. So they did. They did. I, I don't remember that. But I, no, I don't think it did. So, yeah, I don't think they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, right. So the. Um, Nichiren Oracle, um, if you know about him or how, uh, maybe Bob can explain what Nichiren Oracle does. Oh, sure, I will. Yes, well, the Nichiren Oracle is a deity uh, that um, Padmasambhava, the great uh, uh, sort of tantric founder of, um, uh, co-founder of Buddhism in Tibet in the, in the 8th century, that he sort of tamed uh, this uh, came from Central Asia, actually not from Tibet, but from Central Asia, Pehar, a deity called Pehar. And then that deity became a protector for Tibet. And um, although the oracle himself is not an, is not possessed by the deity himself, but by the minister of the deity, Doja Takden, his name is, because they say the deity is too powerful and it would just shatter any human medium, you know. And um, he's very amazing, and he really loves his holiness, especially. I think it, it connects, I'm sure, to Avalokiteshvara. Parmasambhava connects to Avalokiteshvara, and so does the Nature Oracle. And um, he goes, you know, the monastery is very geared, and they go into trance, and they um, and they create a ritual. And then the the one who is the medium of the of the era goes into a trance, and then in that trance, that deity tells the Dalai Lama, gives the Dalai Lama advice and warns him about things and tells him what's going on in the world, what decisions he should make on behalf of the nation, and so on and so on. And he's very, very, people can be a little bit scared of him. He can be very fierce. And I, I love the institution. It's like I always used to say to explain to people what it was. when In the future, if America ever really faces up to all its karmas, and practices anti-racist racist insight properly. And um, it would be like if a, a medium who channeled the spirit of Crazy Horse at the invocation of the, of the Congress 
the joint session instead of just a one minister, but different religious people might inaugurate ritually. But then this medium would come in, acquiring a bow and arrow. <laughs> And he would dance around in a trance wearing heavy equipment that, that his normal physical frame couldn't carry to sort of show that he's really channeling. And then if there was anybody doing anything treasonous or seditious in the Congress against the nation, he would point them out. He wouldn't shoot an arrow at them, but he would point them out. And then they would he would be investigated and so on. And this was part of the Tibetan parliament. Wow. <laughs> and and to, to understand that, it sort of kept a congressperson's honest, you could say, in a good period. And um, so that's why he was waiting for the signal, because the oracle could tell where the Chinese troops were placed. It was a very dangerous time. There, was an, um, there were factions in the Chinese Politburo at that time who wanted to actually to kill His Holiness and the Pension Lama, and not to mention any other monks or anybody. They were very violent at that time. So he really needed this protection, and he went on March 17th of 1959, exactly that date, and managed to slip out looking like a regular soldier, and everyone should know the story. It's a great story. But this detail of the tears, the tears flowing, feeling sad that his owners had to leave his people to speak for them and protect them outside, from outside, because it was too dangerous for him to stay. This made him very, very sad. Right, right. And because... Then, um, because physically, Netron Oracle would not see His Holiness ever again, right? So he didn't. He didn't uh, go to India or anything. He stayed. I'm not sure. Did he? Yeah. That one did not get to go. I, I knew the one in the 1960s who was in India. Mm -hmm. I thought he was the same one who was in Tibet, but I may be wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Right. I, I, I don't know that detail. Once I was fortunate enough to witness his trance. I was staying at the monastery, Netron Monastery, mm -hmm. one day, and then uh, some Tibetan government came to ask him a question. So mm -hmm. he went into trance, and then they said, do you want to watch? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I sat in the back of the room, and I watched the whole process, and it was quite, in a way, scary. He looks yes. so much like he's in pain. It took... He, it took him 40 minutes to go into, uh, he first started with the meditation. Yeah. And it took him 40 minutes to go into a trance and he, right. his body started to shake. And then once he's in trance, he just goes around the room and all these uh, secretaries are like uh, following him with a recorder and a notebook. And it was <laughs> a quite scene. And he passed out, boom. And he didn't wake up for three days. Really? He was, really? Sleep. He yeah, was that's a new guy. He's a great, great guy. Yes. There was yes. an old one. I think maybe the one who was in 1959 might have been the one who was in Dharamsala in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And it, when Nature was very poor and humble at that time, he used to sew things. I got to know him because he sewed my monk's robes when I got mm -hmm. to be a monk. So mm -hmm. he, I, he would go down and I would sit there while he was sewing the robes Aww. and he would talk to me. And then he passed away in the late 70s. And then there was a gap of three or four years. And um, there's another story, but I won't tell that story just this time. But anyway, they were finally his holiness found this good new one, you know, because mm -hmm. the deity itself picks somebody who has a kind of like, like basically a nervous breakdown, mm -hmm. like a shamanistic thing, and then becomes a, a worthy channel, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's the Tuptun Lutrup, the one you must have seen, who is uh, mm -hmm. who's currently still around. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. He's really wonderful. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that's, and, that's unique. See, that's another unique thing in this book, only in this book, is this really, is now this revealed by His Holiness, this right, special right. little things. Yes. Um, and talk about protector. There was another moment in the interview that I got a goose pimple uh, when His Holiness talked about Paldin Lama. And uh, in the interview, Paul Den Lama, uh, not Paul Den Lama, sorry, His Holiness said, well, first of all, Paul Den Lama is the uh, main protector of His Holiness. And where His Holiness said when he fled Tibet to India, he, car he rolled up this tanka and then he carried this uh, special tanka with him all is the it day. Any in a metal tube over his shoulder to make it look like it was a gun. Right, right. He was and, uh, to be a soldier. Yeah, and then uh, His Holiness said, at this very moment, 
during the interview uh, with me, he said, I feel her presence at this very moment right really? here. Yes, and I, 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 got, teary, I got teary. <laughs> it was just so moving uh, to have that kind of uh, relationship and a connection with such an amazing mm -hmm. deity. And I felt good also that Paldin Lamala is always there to protect him. So that was beautiful and wonderful. Oh, yeah, and then something really magical happened to me uh, in the process also. So uh, when I was working on this book, um, a friend of mine uh, who's a Geshema, Geshema is a PhD as a woman, uh, mm -hmm. in Buddhism. Uh, this friend of mine, uh, Geshe Ma in Dharamsala, found out that I was working on this book. Uh -huh. And he, she sent me, she emailed me this file of Padan Lama's Tanka, the actual Tanka that His Holiness took from uh, Tibet. Really? And, I, I yes. Read I was and, so yeah, and then he, she said, do not share with anyone. This is only for you. I don't know why. So I said, okay. But I wanted to put the image on my easel so mm -hmm. I would feel protected by him, by her, right? Mm -hmm. So I tried to print it. And when I print it, she was blank. <laughs> but, but her surroundings were there. Uh -huh. Everything was there but her. So I said, okay, maybe printer is broken. So I tried again. Stop it, stop, stop, stop. Sorry. Yeah, go so, ahead. so I tried to print again. Same thing happened. So I tried to, so I said, this is weird. So I, I printed something totally different. Everything came up perfectly. <laughs> so I said, okay, this is really strange. So I called up a, a Tibetan friend who knows about these things. And she was laughing on the phone. She said, Rimala, this is not rare. This happens all the time. I said, what do you mean it happens all the time? She said, often when you take a photograph of Paldin Lamo's image, like Tanka painting, she often comes out blank. It's either totally white or totally black she wouldn't come out. And she said, among Tibetans, it's, it's not a, a rare thing. So I said, oh, okay, I didn't know. Um, so I took as, it as a sign that Paran Lama La was there for me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, well, positive I, thinking. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to tell you about that and ask you about it, but you told the story now. But I was very surprised because the tradition is that, and it, this is even more honorable and surprising than you know, I think. And that is that no one is supposed to ever see that painting but His Holiness, ever. Mm -hmm. Not even the nun or anybody. Or maybe he showed it to her, I guess. I was mm -hmm. so surprised. Mm -hmm. It's in fact supposed to be practically dangerous for anybody to see it except His Holiness. It's like a, it's, it's such a special, that particular painting, but not, mm -hmm. the, not the theme itself. Mm -hmm. There are paintings of Ben Hummel, but that one, that anybody mm -hmm. ever sees it other than His Holiness, mm -hmm. something really astonishing, actually. Mm -hmm. really is. So I wasn't I wasn't surprised when I heard it, it wouldn't print, but even that she showed it to you, or even that she got it, I was very surprised. So I, I really was. Th this it's bizarre very, experience really puzzled me. So I reached out to Tenzin Taklala, the secretary and the nephew of His uh -huh. Holiness, yeah, and he said. Pardon Lamla is always there to protect his holiness. Um, so he wasn't also surprised either. So again, I decided to take it as an auspicious uh, thing. It's terribly, it's very, very auspicious. Yes, yes. When, when, uh, when his holiness asked us to found Tibet House, actually, he, he, mm. he told us that she was the special protectress of Tibet House. Mm. He told us, and we, we have a special thing to her there, you know. She's mm -hmm. kind of actually connected to Tara, you know, but she's a fierce form of Tara. She, in, in a Hindu Kali, you know, she's the Kali Devi uh, form. And um, at Lake, where is her called her soul lake in the southeastern, southeast of Lhasa, mm -hmm. is where they go to see in the reflection as which you tell the story. He tells the story here, mm -hmm. uh, where they discover it's the TV screen, I think he said it. It's like a TV 
screen. Yes. They saw the picture of his house in that lake. You know? And uh, yeah, he said, holy, lake. "Holy television," he said. That's in right. The interview, yeah. <laughs> in the Lamo Channel. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Brother Lamo Cable, yes. That's right. So, so yes, all these magical things happened. And then I've had some well, magic. Can I say one more thing? I want to say another thing. Oh, you, yes. Just hold it for a second. In this light of the magical things happening, you mustn't worry about only having had that one hour because you had many dream interviews. And you see, that's not just your subjective dream. He, he can be present in people's dreams. He has that ability. And so you're really meeting him. You really are having more audiences with him in the dream. Mm -hmm. And I can give you a very simple example that there was a Tibetan guy who had an audience scheduled with his holiness and was waiting in Dharamsala for the day to come, you know, went there like a week ahead and was waiting. And then one night, about three days before the time of the meeting, he met his holiness in a dream. And his holiness said to him in the dream, look, the relative you're worrying about, whether you can see or not, is now in Kathmandu looking for you, but they will have to go back to Tibet very soon. If you don't get over there, get off your butt and get over there, you're going to miss him. So get going. So he then took it seriously. He got on a bus or whatever it took, and he got to Kathmandu and just found the relative about to depart again for Tibet. And then came back to Dharamsala after the relative, for whatever reason, had to go back to Tibet. It was in the 80s when there was some movement back and forth. It wasn't quite so strict as now. And uh, then he came back and he thanked his holiness for it in the dream. And his holiness told the story. I mean, that's where I heard the story. And uh, and his holiness was like, oh, wow, that's really great. I could have a much easier audience schedule if I could <laughs> have people sit around and dream, you know, and then I wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have to come through security and the whole thing. You know, I could just, <laughs> so he made that joke, you know. So that means that you're really seeing him more and he's telling you and teaching you more things in the dream. And so this book is, comes from a real working, a working relationship that's longer than just that, that initial hour. So, so please don't feel worried that you only had one hour, well, 15 minutes actually, that, that turned into an hour, which I know that sensation, and then you get unpopular with the secretaries. I get it. I get it. <laughs> They have the other people waiting, you know. So they get I more. know when when His Holiness told his attendants uh, to bring tea for me, there were ten secretaries in the room. They all went like this. I know Be because tea means another half an hour. <laughs> so, <laughs> they were all like not happy. But <laughs> but uh, thank you for saying that, Bob. It, it means a lot, and and I do. Uh, I do believe you because I've had some magical experiences with His Holiness and everyone who, who's listening, please do, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this because I, I, I respect him and I adore him and everything, but these things really happened. Like one, one year um, I was, I mean, I'm, I've been so fortunate to be in his presence so, for so many years over the years, um, but uh, one time at this international peace summit in Japan, I was a presenter on the stage. And uh, one day during the luncheon, um, oh, oh, I also did, uh, I had this honor to paint uh, an in the event poster. Mm -hmm. So um, His Holiness Desmond Tutu and late Betty Williams, they all wanted to autograph on the back of my painting that I did for the uh, for the event. Mm -hmm. So they all stood up and then in front of my painting and I was standing right behind His Holiness. I was holding three pastels, like crayons, three different colors. And in my heart, in my mind, I was hoping, oh, it will be so great if each one uses a different color. <laughs> but I didn't say anything because I thought it was too much to ask. I was standing right behind His Holiness. And His Holiness turned around and he, he looks at my face and says, you want me to, you want me to use different color, right? <laughs> <laughs> really? Absolutely. And I was like, I was so shocked because I, I didn't say anything. And he obviously read my mind. And I got so nervous and shocked. And I said, no, no, I don't. <laughs> oh, no. 
<laughs> I, I answered the opposite instead of a yes. And I was so nervous. I said, no, but, but they ended up dif using different uh, crayons because his holiness did so. So <laughs> that, that was so bizarre. And I knew in that moment that he, I, I don't know what it is. He has some kind of a very uh, special ability. Oh, sure. Oh, That's totally. Right. Sure. And yes, yes. Um, so, and also, uh, I have many stories like this with His Holiness. And, um, but uh, one, uh, one, one of other um, very memorable memories is that, oh, Christine, could you show me the, uh, could you show the image of, of my home? Uh, the picture, please. Um, so in 2010, I had uh, an audience in New York because um, I wanted to report my, my um, books that I had made for the Tibetan children and, and they offered me an audience. So I was the first in the morning it was at the Waldorf in New York, and I was, at, I was the first audience in the morning. And I was waiting in the hallway to go into the room, and, and you know, I was happy and nervous. And so the door opens, His Holiness is there, and he said, oh, it's you, it's so wonderful to see you. But his face was a little bit down. I could see his energy was a little bit down. So I got nervous. I said, oh my gosh, he doesn't want to see me. He hates me. I just want to go home. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and the audience started. I presented this um, portrait. Actually, you can't see from the, the photo. But I had painted a portrait of his late dog um, that he I had did. adopted, yes. But this is interesting because I wrote about this story in this new book. Mm -hmm. This is also not shared with others at all. Uh, His Holiness stopped naming pets. That's right. Be because it, it creates attachment. Uh, when he lost his first dog, I think his name was, her name was Dolma. Uh -huh. He was so sad. He was so sad. He said he didn't want to go through that again. So mm -hmm. he decided not to name any pets he has, dogs or whatever. But he would just love them from afar mm -hmm. without naming them. And uh, I thought that was such a beautiful story. And not a story. It's an episode. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wrote about, I wrote about that in, in this book. Mm -hmm. But so when I presented this uh, portrait of his late dog, he just started to, to be so happy and then cheerful. And I felt good that I'm, I made his difficult day a little bit easier. <laughs> um, I, and I found out later that day that he had just heard the news that the President Obama canceled his audience. Um, because of some situations. So I think I can imagine how disappointed his holiness was. I think he mm -hmm. came to the US basically to meet Obama. Um, mm -hmm. So my audience was right after that. So of course he was a little bit disappointed. Um, right. but, he did uh, eventually, he immensely did meet Obama, right? But later. Uh, oh, oh, is that but right? Him. Okay, okay, that's good. That's yeah, good you're right, know. Obama did. Obama canceled the first meeting, right. thinking, thinking he would get some concession from the Chinese for doing that, but, and he, but he did it. And instead, mm -hmm. he sent Valerie Jarrett to Dharamsala to see his holiness, his assistant. But then he realized that didn't really make any difference in the way the Chinese behaved. So then he mm -hmm. did it. He saw his holiness a year or two later. Oh, time. right. But not in that visit, right? I remember right, that. Right. Yes. The, the beginning. yes. But uh, yeah, I witnessed with my own eyes how disappointed he was. And, uh, but boom, he just, he doesn't get attached to one emotion, right? So boom, next minute, he was very happy. <laughs> and <laughs> happy to see the dog. Well, he was also happy because you were so happy that in the picture you can see how happy you were. Right. Uh, so um, 
Yes, it, it was a wonderful moment. And um, I saw his human side, which was so wonderful that he's often says he is human. He gets angry, he gets sad. It's the difference between us and him is that he doesn't hold on to certain emotion like anger, hatred, jealousy. Right, right. It just passes like that. That's, that's, that's what you say, yes. Mm -hmm, yeah, so Bob, do you have any personal wonderful i'm sure you have so many because you know him for for many many years and you're so close to him but do you have any episodes that you like to share with us well well yeah the one that i well maybe i'll if since you ask the one about the nature oracle i can tell <laughs> so it's very funny he has a great sense of humor you know and uh so it was 1984 and we were we were in westminster abbey where he was staying with, uh, with um, Dean Carpenter, was his name at the time, who was the Dean of Westminster Abbey. And I had an interview with him arranged for, uh, for um, I, think, I think it was Parabola, or maybe it was Rolling Stone, I don't remember, who I was interviewing him for, but I was interviewing him. And so, you know, I was there with him and we did the interview. And then we were finished with the interview and then we were doing the thing that we usually do when, when we when we're annoying the secretaries, and he has a tea brought, and then we start just chatting, and um, he takes a break, kind of, you know, and then he gets very, he gets a kind of, um, he likes to act up a little bit, you know, so then I'm asking him, because uh, this was I said uh, there was three or four year gap between the different naturals, the old one who had been my friend and sewed my robe and so on had passed away and there was no new one. So I was saying, well, where is the new one? What's the, what's the, you know, what's the delay? You know, like, can't they find a monk in nature who, who can do this? Or is there no proper one? And then he, then he gets, uh, obviously he gets into, he decides to do some mischief. So then he says, well, he says, I really wanted someone. I think we were speaking English actually, because I'd done the interview in English. With him. He says, I wanted someone but we, we, we both uh, break into the different languages. He, he jokingly says, well, I, well, shall we speak my broken English or your broken Tibetan? He says, <laughs> which we go back and forth. And uh, he says, oh, I was looking for someone who was a really big and their face would get really red with a really loud voice. <laughs> and when they would speak, people would be really scared and they'd really behave. He says, and, and I was looking, he was sitting in an armchair there, and I was sitting on the ottoman of the armchair. It's the same height, but a little distance, you know, separated and in doing the interview. And um, and then he sort of comes forward in the chair and says, really? And then he kind of looks at me and he pauses and he says, in fact, he said, someone just like you. And he shouts and he grabs my shoulders really strongly, practically shakes me. And he has a, in in English. He's just like you, really. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> but you know, I know him so, and and I, so I I uh, was quick on my feet. I said, oh yeah, but you know, sure, your honest, I'd love to serve. I said, but you know, it would never work, your honest, because the Tibetans would never listen to an Indian, no matter how angry and loud a voice they were. <laughs> and then he let me go, and they said, oh, I guess you're right, you know. <laughs> And of course, he didn't mean it seriously. <laughs> Obviously, he just wanted to scare me, and he sure did, because you know I'd been in a bunch of those seances, you know, and it's they they have quite a headache afterwards, and as you say, they pass out. And I didn't ever know they passed out for three days, but for three hours or overnight, for sure, you know, I've, I've seen that both the new one and the old one, and because uh, it's apparently really strenuous to be in that state, you know, and, and have to dance around and everything. But I'll never forget it. And then he always, for years afterwards, when we would meet somewhere, you know, in some van to something, and when he first seen me, he'd kind of, like, <laughs> all he had to do was do like that, and I would like <laughs> jump like that. So, you know, <laughs> because he remembered that. And he's amazing. And oh, another thing that's really amazing that I must say is not so spectacular, but very amazing, is that when His Holiness uh, ganged up with Geshe Wangal, uh, my, my original Geshe teacher here in America, the Mongolian guy from Drebong, um, and they ganged up and said, you know what you have to do? 
now that you have PhD, you know, don't just be a professor. You have to translate the whole tenure. They, they made this argument. And don't just do John Thomas writing all the tenure. Tenure is like 4,000 books, you know, in the collection there from translated from Sanskrit originally. So I'm like, oh, thanks a lot. Yet thousands of books. How am I going to do that? You know, I give me a break. And they say, oh, don't, don't be sad. We don't mean you're going to get it all done. You just start it. And then it'll be three generations, they said, you know, to sort of give me solace, you know, the hopelessness of it. And so I've been working on that since then. That was almost 50 years now. So in about 2000, I think 13, something like that, I raised funds and created a chair in Tibetan history, also at Columbia, to go with my chair in the philosophy and the language. And I invited his holiness to the campus and and President Bollinger of Columbia also invited him. You know, we made a joint thing and he had an event and blah, blah, blah. And then at, toward the end of the event, he grabbed Bollinger and Mrs. Bollinger came and wanted to join him for lunch, which was another invitation from the dean of the divinity school. And so, and I wasn't invited and neither was he, President Bollinger. But the Dalai Lama grabbed us both and said, I want to take you with me. And he and the dean from the divinity school said, well, okay, okay, no, well, that's some more plates. So we were dragged across the street to the divinity school, to the lunch. And then the minute he sat down with Bollinger, he turns to him and he says, well, President Bollinger, he said, I'm sure you know that Professor Thurman will not finish his project for three generations. Or no, he, he needs he will need three generations to finish his project. And I'm like, what? You know, because we never discussed that single statement made in 1971 or two, you know, in front of Geshe Wango. And now 2013, that's like what, 50 years later, practically, or 40 years later. We never discussed it about the three generation thing that he'd said to me. But he says, it'll, you know, he won't finish project for three generations. So Bollinger is very smart. He, he, and he says, he says, oh, that's really great, Rolandus. Oh, it's too bad we don't have that reincarnation system here at Columbia. <laughs> he says, and then, then we, everybody laughs. And then I bit my tongue because I wanted to complain and say, what do you mean? I can't reincarnate in my chair when I die to finish, et cetera. But I didn't say that because I didn't want to interfere them having, a, having their thing. You know? <laughs> But, but to me, what, the amazing thing about that story is that His Holiness's memory of that sort of important thing to him to see that gets done, you know, from a 50 year before he's the one who said three generations. Since then, he wrote letters supporting the project, but he never mentioned three generations. And we never discussed that again. Never said, oh, yes, Your Holiness, I'm doing it for the third generation. Never. And yet he immediately pops that out the minute sits down with the president of the university that employs me and where we have the center trying to do that. I was really, really shook by that, you know. That's an amazing story, Bob. It, it really is amazing. He, he is like that, I think, you know. And, and you know, this is the wonderful thing about the Buddhist view of the deeds of Avalokiteshvara, you know. And, um, of course, there are other Avalokiteshvara incarnations around, like Kamapa is another one, and must be hundreds of them, because... They have this idea of a very prolific Jesus, you could say. <laughs> Millions of bodies, you know, doing things for beings. But sort of his sort of very, very special one is really, you can see why the Tibetans are so completely besotted and devoted to him, you know, because they, they have probably generations of these stories for hundreds of years now of doing it, you know. And, you know, when he resigned in 2011 and said he would no longer take responsibility, for, for the political fate of the country, you know, after his next incarnation, 15th Dalai Lama will not do that. And they, the Tibetans were hell bent to get him to withdraw that and not write it down in the constitution, but he refused. And we, he and I had a big argument about it also, because I was saying, oh, they want you to, oh, come on, you know, like, you don't have to go to the office, you know, but you just like the Queen of England. And you know what he said? He said, I don't want to be a prisoner like Lady Di. <laughs> That's, what oh. he said. That's what he said. Mm. In other words, he didn't want to just be a symbolic figure like that. Mm. And he mentioned, you can see that he was very moved and touched by her troubles, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Diana, you know. Right, anyway. right. Anyway, he's so great. But, you know, you see the way, 
you have, I, well, they don't see it when I show it somehow because of my lighting here. But the way you, even his picture, the way you did his picture on this cover shows the sweet way that you see him and the way he is toward you. It's very, very special. And both hands like that, you know. And you know, those are the hands, do you know what they are? They're what makes that so wonderful about his life. Though that is the gesture of Abaya, you know, don't fear. Mm. The gesture shown to the planet through your book, because he's narrating it. It's his own, he's writing with you. He's totally your colleague there. And he's showing the planet, don't fear, you know, as dark as things look with the climate, with the COVID, with the bad politicians, the false, the dictator leaders type, would be an actual dictator leaders. Very dangerous, you know, and but you know, and, and and democracy in peril, which it really is, you know. And although I think we're going to make it, but he's showing, don't fear, you know. This is we'll make. That's great. We'll, we'll make it, you know. That's great because he and, often and does you get this. It. You got it. You did it. You got it. No, because uh, because often he he does this gesture when he talks, and then again, this image came into my dream. This cover was the last piece I drew among yes. 14 drawings. And then one night, this image came to my dream. Yeah. And, and he had his hands like this. Yeah. And um, I'm and glad. They're, yeah. They're peace doves. They're doves of peace. You know? I'm peace glad uh, you told me about this abaya because one monk actually from Netrun said, these hand gestures are not the most auspicious ones. Why did you do this? Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, don't tell me it's too late. But uh, no, he's mixing up, you know, the, 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 he's, this one, mm -hmm. when you do like this, you know, where mm -hmm. you put up two fingers and hold the two fingers down, that's, okay. like, that's like a warning kind of hard thing. Oh, you know? I see. This one is, I'll, I'll take care of it. You know, I'm helping out. It'll That's work out. Great. Don't fear, you know. And as That's you know, really you know, great. in generosity, there's said to be three kinds or four kinds of generosity: mm. the generosity of giving of material things, the generosity of giving protection, mm. the generosity of giving love, and the generosity of giving teaching. You know, those four. There, or you can drop out the love because they're all love, so you can make it three or four. But so this is a very key one. You know, it's the most important one after the you know feeding someone. You know, giving them. Material stuff oh, to help. Them. That's really Don't good afraid. to know. Don't be afraid. Thank you. Protection. No, it, it means both a lot. Hands, and he's holding up the flowers, the blossoms of compassion, and the and the, the peace dove birds are flying here and there to make peace. And oh, that's great! It's good to know. Effort. Thank you, because the his office approved everything. Oh, so yeah. uh, they saw the cover, and then they approved everything. So I, I didn't see any problem and oh, now no, no oh good good that's good to know thank it's you it's a monk who's feeling nervous he's just feeling <laughs> nervous you know and you don't fear in other words in other words, what he means the monk is not really wrong in the sense that <laughs> somebody who you show that to is maybe being afraid oh i see you think okay. don't be afraid so the monk okay. is just keying off that oh that's in a situation where someone might be afraid you know? that's great that's so wonderful that's okay. he has his point oh. too Thank yes. you, Bob. Thank you so much. And I, I, I'm a little bit Bob. sensitive about thank time. You, and maybe, maybe, maybe we should take some Q and A. Um, sure. Like we have... Sure. Let's see. Chat. Chat. See what the chat is. Do you can you cue the chat on your on your thing? Let's see. Okay. Uh. We have uh, a number of questions mm -hmm. that have come through, and at this time, we welcome anyone to submit their questions um, directly in the chat. Um, so one question that came up uh, earlier when we were talking about the Nichung Oracle was um, how has the Nichung Oracle survived as an institution uh, in Tibet? That's for you, Bob. Oh, in Tibet, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't survive. Um, it is, um, uh, it's near Drebung Monastery because the great fifth Dalai Lama brought it. He wanted to bring it to Drebung Monastery, but um, the the guy who was carrying the the trunk, you know, he, with the with the mask and various other special objects connected to it, were bringing it from a, a Samia monastery where it had been kept before that. Uh, the the chest itself became heavier and heavier and heavier as he got near the monastery, and he couldn't believe why is it getting heavier? I've been carrying this chest, you know, and now it's practically couldn't. He had to put it down. 
at the, where a few, like a, uh, a mile and a half from Drebung on the path to Drebung, but near still, but or like half three quarters of a mile, maybe I don't know exactly. And uh, then, of course, being Tibetan, he was curious, so he then opened the chest, and then a dove flew out of it and went and landed in a special tree, and then. Um, he couldn't move anything after that, and he couldn't catch the dove, and he was very embarrassed. But anyway, Fifth Dalai Lama got the news and said, well, that means that's where he wants to stay. So they built the Ne Chung, which Ne Chung means the little place, because he wanted to have his own place, not a temple in, in the Drebung complex, Drebung monastery complex. And so it was a marvelous, uh, beautiful art. The Ne Chung people have always been famous for beautiful art, and also especially, they had a specialty in making applique Tankas mm -hmm. and paintings of different deities that were really extraordinary, and because they had they had a sort of visionary element about them because of their ritual connected with the, the deity, and um, and that's been of course shut down completely. It was not burned to the ground, but it was pretty wrecked. Some of the hell holy objects were smuggled out to India during the escape, and some were hidden during the the all the destruction which happened before cultural revolution in fact it was not just in cultural but more in cultural revolution as well and so but lately it's been sort of refurbished as a tourist attraction and there's a few monks but there's there's no it's no there's no live uh, practice there really and um but you know people can stop by and look at it it's a little scary because it has like flayed corp flayed uh, uh, corpses and, and skeleton things it's because it's a fierce it's a fierce temple you know so it's a little fierce looking so i think some of the tourists may be just scared to go it's like a halloween temple <laughs> something like that but uh, of course it's a really beautiful place and there's a magic still at the place when you visit it and in the, when i was last there in the early noughts before I stopped getting visas, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, some old monk came up and sent a message, etc. You know, so there there were still a few of the old timers who probably had been in prison for some time and then got out and then they sort of hang around like janitors or something. But by now, I don't even know if they're still there or safe or anything. You don't know. The whole thing, you know, very sad statement is that like the Uyghurs which everybody makes a fuss about now, how they're trying to cure the Uyghurs of Islam, the insane policy of Xi, who has gone nuts, I think, lately. And then you have the, the Tibetans, they've been trying to cure them of Buddhism as if it was a disease against it rather than communism. And they're not even communists themselves anymore, really. Um, and so the Tibetans' culture is under absolutely terrible pressure in Tibet, really. I mean, I get, uh, you know, uh, reports of this speeches of the party bosses, you know, the Chinese rulers in Tibet, and they're putting policemen in every house, just like in the Uyghur country, you know, like in Xinjiang, and they're suppressing everything completely. No, no, China, no, no, no Tibetan language medium in the schools, what schools such as there are, which are not that many for the Tibetans anyway, but even the ones they are, they have to study in Chinese and so on. So they're trying to wipe out the language and everything. It's really bad now. Talk about his holiness being down. He needs you to make some more <laughs> pictures of animals, <laughs> which may cheer him up, you know, really. Well, that cheered me up. You know, the way you, I wanted to just point out in your book, away from this is like, for example, one of the most marvelous things in the book, his holiness says that he kind of was, and he always said that he's always said, but he says he was always uh, unhappy in the Potala because he was mm -hmm. so lonely there. Yeah. And he, but there was a mouse who would come and 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 lick the butter, in the butter lamps, which I'm sure his horns would blow out so that it wouldn't, it wouldn't burn him, yeah. And and it's this marvelous picture, and at that time, you know, like we might think, that the lamas, you know, these other high lamas with their hats, are very impressive. If we and if we like Tibetan Buddhism, we think, oh, gee, I can meet a lama, the one with the mustache is sort of like the ghost of the thirteenth Dalai Lama, I think. But anyway, and to the, to the little boy, they look kind of a little bit worrisome, you know, like disciplinarians or something. But the little mouse who's looking for the butter here in the in the thing, if you show, did they show that picture or maybe they're not? It's on page uh, page sixteen. Yeah. But if you have it, but it's okay. But the little mouse is so cute. And then you back to the mouse, you pick out the mouse on page. On, the, on page 19, just sitting there, they, they, the, the designer picked that out as a detail from your painting. And it's the sweetest little mouth. 
<laughs> it made me very, that's his holiness's, hold it up a little higher. That's his holiness's companion as a little child, lonely in the potala. And I think he loves you so much, uh, Arima, because you see these things that he sees. And other people maybe not paying attention to their thinking big thoughts and thinking about big llamas and things. And you see, but you paint a picture of his former pet that he loved so much that he didn't want to have another one. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. great. And then oh, the other thing, I also love you, anything. And then he always says that, you know, his great teacher of compassion, even more than Kuno Lama Rinpoche or Ling Rinpoche, et cetera. And right after Ling Rinpoche, you know, who, who you have that great painting of Wuling, who I was also, my, his holiness made me be his student also. And he was so wonderful and marvelous. I have great stories about him. But anyway, he's there. And he's showing the sign of intelligence, you know, in his hand. And that's, that's wisdom, that's the wisdom sign. The two the thumb and the forefinger together mean precise insight and understanding. And the three fingers standing up mean Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, mm -hmm. the three jewels of refuge, you know, the teacher, the teaching, and the people trying to practice the teaching in the community. And his smile is so wonderful, you know. Anyway, right after that, Instead of something more like Dalai Lama getting the Nobel Prize or Dalai Lama doing this and that, you go back to his first teacher of compassion, which is mom. Yep. There in Amdo, at the, you go back to the beginning, and there she's giving a stranger who's hungry a, a cookie, you know, or a piece of bread, you know. And that, that, I mean, that's your choice, or unless he told you in a dream. But it is a brilliant one it, because it's so real and it's so true. And he always says, I really learned compassion from my mom. And she, that's really the great teacher is the mom. It's just so, I don't know, I love it. And then and he says this, in the end, kindness is my religion. You know, that's his great, great statement for our planet, you know. Yes. And there she is, being, mom is being kind to this humble stranger. Mm -hmm. And they, they were not a rich family, but they, they were not also a super poor one. But still, it's just, just totally, totally fantastic. And all the blossoms and flowers, it's just, it's beautiful. So, it really is beautiful. This is. Yeah, it's, um, I didn't, I realized later when this book came out, um, I started with his mother and ended with his mother. Uh, I wasn't conscious of it because um, I spent months and months researching, but when I actually wrote the text, it took me less than two hours. And it was the easiest thing. Uh, something else was writing for me. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I didn't plan anything, right? So I just started yeah. and then and boom. So uh, I had some help from somewhere above, I think. And um, it started with his own mother and then ended with his own mother. So uh, it, as you pointed out, it, it was wonderful. And then I didn't consciously, consciously do it. <laughs> but, uh, you did it great. Your point is, you know, you're, you're a great artist and the artist is, you know, and this dreaming thing that you're doing is really, really cool, you know, because, you know, the dream yoga is like a dream yoga, you know, mm -hmm. because the whole point of dream yoga, which is one of the six yogas of Naropa, you know, is that in a dream, you do make your environment as well as your subjective reaction to your environment. Mm -hmm. So you actually are the artist of the environment, mm -hmm. which we actually are in when we're awake, but we don't know that because we wrongly think that the other things are just out there by them, then they're sort of making themselves because of our false projection of intrinsic realities and identities into everything. But enlightened person knows that waking is also a dream, you know, and, and the way of therefore cultivating the abilities to shape the world in a good way, in a loving, compassionate, happy way, is to practice it from the dream, you know. And then you can share that through your art skill, you know, and that's really wonderful. Well, thank really. you. Thank it's you. Just... I, I'm not conscious of it, but uh, I, I guess that's one of the gifts um, I, I received. And uh, yeah. I, I continue to use it for a good cause. 
Absolutely. And please keep doing, keep going. You still <laughs> didn't get there. You know, imagine how the poor Chinese people, Tibetan people, it's really worrisome. Wonderful right. people of Taiwan, people of Hong Kong. The disease of people thinking that they will achieve happiness by controlling other people is really a disease. It is. And it means that they don't they're unable to control themselves so that they're really quite unhappy themselves. Mm -hmm. So we actually have to be rather than angry with them. I mean we should strongly oppose such people, but rather than out of anger, we should do it because we should be compassionate for them because they are not happy. That's why they, they think they will be when they control everything, you know. Mm -hmm. But they, clearly they won't be. They'll just impose their unhappiness on all of it. Right. Yeah. Why his holiness sure. is such a great, great teacher of democracy, you know. Yes, he has to stay strong and, and be with us for many more years. He does. Right? Definitely. Yes, and, and we, yes. Have to, we have to make sure that our country still represents that ideal. Remember when he first came to America and he was in the Jefferson Memorial, mm -hmm. and I believe he had just been to Monticello, mm -hmm. and whatever Thomas Jefferson's other problems may have been, um, you know, with the race thing. Uh, nevertheless, he was a bodhisattva for sure. And he, he would he told everyone at that time, oh, this guy is so great. I must be his reincarnation, he said. <laughs> you know, because Thomas Jefferson said education is the main thing in life. That's what you have to do. And yeah. he loved all the little drink trinkets that Jefferson had made in Monticello. And he probably didn't know at that time. And people who complain about Jefferson didn't know that John Thomas Jefferson, you know, Pass or what do you call it? He he sponsored in the Virginia legislature before the Declaration of Independence two bills to emancipate slaves in Virginia. He did that, but they were not, of course, passed. But you know, so it, it was he was ahead of his time. You know, yeah. And he definitely. did write, "All men are created equal." You know, mm, and he wonderful. and he he. I'm sure by the end of his life, he meant to include women. Mm. <laughs> Even though the people didn't give them the vote, the idiots, the other idiots, never mind. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and do that humans and, the, and even all animals, let's say, all, all living beings. Anyway. Mm. Anyway, okay. So, so, okay. Any other question people have? Yes. Yeah, anyway, we are, everyone should remember we're all celebrating this and we're, we, are, we are plumbing, we're looking at Rima's wonderful work. And I hope everybody will get Rima's wonderful book. They must, and because it really no, I, I'm 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 going to hand them out right and left if I can, you know, because it's just so touching and it's just I can't how great it is. Thank you. And so it's good, so it's simple and easy for people, and also for children as well, you know. And you must, you must. I can help you if you don't have a good translator. You must have it translated into Tibetan. Oh yes, no, no, we're working and on you already, it. Okay. You have someone working already. I, I, wisdom, I think there's a. Oh, wisdom is okay. Good. Oh, yeah. Yes. Daniel, Daniel will see to it. Yeah, because, and then because uh, it I'm, must be circulate widely in Tibetan. Yes, and, I'm going um, to an send e many also, copies there. Ebook in Tibetan, so they can get around the firewall and see it in right. Tibetan. Right. They'll be so exactly. happy. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Will. I, I'm. Uh, I'm Must sending. I'm sending many Tibetan versions to exile. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Definitely. Yeah. Really Chris, Kristen, do we have one more question? Yes, do we? we do. We have a number of questions, actually. Um, we have one for you, Rima. We were talking earlier about your dreams. Um, so the question is, um, were the colors that you used in your illustrations, um, were those also present to you um, during your dreams? And also, did you make any direct observation sketches for the book? Thank you. Great questions. First of all, I my dreams are so vivid uh, the the color the intensity of the colors in my dreams uh doesn't exist in this world and somebody said to me oh well when you do this sort of drugs you, you know colors become that way i i have never done those so i don't know but apparently those are the colors you see when you're tripping uh, i've never tripped before so i have no idea but they're intense uh, much more intense than the, the drawings, actual drawings I make. And uh, I didn't know some people have dreams in black and white. I've never had dreams in black and white. My, my dreams are always, always 
very, very vivid, colorful. So I was talking to somebody once who only sees, have dreams, has dreams in black and white. I couldn't believe it. And he couldn't believe me that I see dreams in colors. So I don't know, uh, I, I guess everybody's different. I do not do any sketches. I have no thumbnails. Um, I go directly on the canvas or paper. Uh, I don't even do like uh, outlines. I just boom, go like that. Um, again, I've, I've already seen the visions I'm going to draw, right, in my dream. So I don't need to do any planning because I know what I'm doing. Uh, my work is to manifest the vision I saw in my dream. So uh, something goes, uh, it's like a trance. Something works through me. So I do not remember how I work. Uh, when I finish my painting, I look back. I don't remember how I did it normally. I lose sense of time. Uh, I am awake. I know what I'm doing, but... I don't know, it's hard to explain, but I, my thinking goes somewhere else. I don't think when I paint. Um, so that's how I've been working uh, basically all my, all my life. That's wonderful. <laughs> that's really good. Well, um, how's the time, Beata? I think we're like we're good. We're we have time for another question or two okay. for sure. Okay. We have another we have another fifteen minutes or so. And, oh, good. Uh, oh, great. Oh, good. Okay. So, What's the uh, question? Another question we had was, uh, in both of your opinions, what is the best gift we can give to His Holiness for his birthday? <laughs> well, he said himself. He said uh, the best birthday gift he can get is if you do something for anyone else. Mm -hmm. And people just be of help to anybody and do something good and kind for whoever it is. And uh, a few, you know, six months ago, I would I would have said vote <laughs> or do something or help people overcome the injustice and the stupidity and the insurrection and the whole thing. Try to calm them down. Actually, I I, I had a thing the other day on July fourth. I woke up with the, with the wish for for the people, and I, I did a podcast to live stream to, to share that, not that I expect that type of people will probably be on my live stream. But anyway, I said, I think the people who are mad about this and that following the, the crazy idea that, you know, there is something to have an insurrection about, uh, they, they think one thing that they should, they can keep their, their view and they don't have to like think they're wrong even, they can just feel whatever but try to watch less Fox News, American Online Network, and any of these people whose job obviously is not to inform them of anything particularly, but just to make them more mad all the time. So any kind of show that constantly agitates you and makes you mad and frustrated, you should just watch less of it, even if you want to hold your view that there's something wrong, rotten in the state of Denmark, which actually is things are starting to go right a little bit, in fact. But anyway, if you want to hold that, if you hold it, don't think some libtard is trying to tell you not to. But don't you don't need to reinforce it by being someone telling you things that make you mad. Just let yourself calm down and feel peaceful in your in your upset. You can still be annoyed or feel something's wrong, but do it in a peaceful way. Mm -hmm. So your own body is not agitated by I have to go out and blow up something or do something, mm -hmm. shoot someone, or do something. Try to Minimize the agitation in your mind, even if you keep your view, it's fine. I'm not against, I'm not going to argue against it. I mean, I would if you wanted to hear something, but that's not, you, know, you don't have to listen to me, but just be calm yourself. Okay. So then, you know, you can make things go right better if you're calm. So that was my, that's, that I feel that's the best I can do. I can't debate them. Because they don't want to debate. It was this wonderful thing that I, I'm, in, I'm totally in love with Heather Scott Richardson. If nobody sees her newsletter, which is free, um, you know, you should look it up online. And she puts this current struggle that we're going through in America to save our democracy and to keep it alive and to revitalize it. She puts it in the context of the whole of our history in the most brilliant and kind and, and well-informed way. She's a history professor. And um, 
she um, she she did a brilliant thing. I thought where de- in the Declaration of Independence it said it was a self-evident truth that everyone is equal. And then by Lincoln's time in the middle of the Civil War, he said the country is dedicated to the proposition that all things are all humans are made are are, are equal. You know, you know the government of the people by the people. You know the Gettysburg Address, right? So it's a proposition by then, meaning it's up for debate because they were having a war about it, right? Where the slave people wanted to keep slaves and say they weren't equal. And so now, what is it now? Is it a, is it a self-evident truth or is it a proposition? And I, was, I said, I think it should be our vow, our determination that we're going to keep this alive. And I think His Holiness is the one who is keeping this alive in spite of having been abused for 70 or 80 years, since 1950, that's 70, 71 years since the invasion of 1950, you know? And at 15, he had to be, remember he said he didn't want to be, he wanted to wait to 18. And he had to be the leader, political leader, and politically responsible at 15. So for those many years, 1950 to 2021, he still has been, you know, dominated rather than dialogued with, you know? So I think our vow, we can for his birthday, we can make a vow like a bodhisattva vow, but we don't, if we're not Buddhists, we don't have to do that. We can make it like a democracy vow. Mm-hmm. So it's it is a self-evident truth. It is a proposition that we defend, and we make a vow, a determination to defend it, so that everyone is equal and there's justice for everyone and opportunity for everyone and mm-hmm. safety for everyone. And he's holding up his two hands for safety. Don't be afraid for everyone. So that maybe that's our way of fulfilling his birthday, Mm. I would say. I Uh, agree with you, Bob. I I really do. As His Holiness says every year on his birthday, he says, all I want is for you to be compassionate. So I think today, especially today, we can try to be extra compassionate yes. to ourselves, to yes. your neighbors, to your family, friends, strangers. Yes. And also, he wouldn't say this to, to us, but I think it. we can, as much as we can, we can talk to people about Tibet, how we can help Tibetans inside of Tibet or Tibetans around you um, or to, to help them preserve preserve their culture, language, culture, all these important mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the least we can do. Um, there are a lot of people still in this world who are not aware of uh, Tibet, mm-hmm. Tibetan tragedy. So it helps to just talk about it and bring, bring mm-hmm. the awareness, right? Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. one becomes 10, 10 becomes 100, 100 becomes 1,000 it grows. So I think that's also a, a nice gift to give mm-hmm. for his holiness, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. That's great. Just to underline the book that you and he wrote together, one other last, if I could add one tiny little key thing, like a note to what you said about the compassion, because some people will think by being compassionate, they're focusing on the suffering of others so much that they become miserable. But the key thing is, he says, I ask you right here in your book, he says, I ask you to cultivate compassion because by doing so, you will be happier. That's key. Mm -hmm. So the other thing you can do for his birthday is cheer up (laughs) and be happy yourself. Yes. And then by doing that, you'll be effectively compassionate to other people. Yes. You get all the... I mean, they're, you know, they just saw that apartment building fell down on the head of all those poor retired people in Florida. Mm -hmm. And then all these terrible things in in Ethiopia. And oh, it's just awful. And the climate is going to destroy everybody's life. If if fossil fuel people keep keep domineering and and pushing their products. And so, you know, but as aware as we should be of all of that, compassionately, we have to do it in a happy way. And... uh, and that's, what, that's the it's thing. It's wonderful. And that's that's, what, that's how we book, love you. Your book, uh, your book makes me really happy. Oh, and I think you make everyone happy. So buy her book. <laughs> that's <laughs> what you can do for his birthday. Okay, get the thank book. you. All right? Thank you so much. And, thank um, you, everyone. 
Thank and you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Tibet House. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Janet Lou. Jen. <laughs> Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Lima. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, right. Jen. Have a good night, everyone. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Okay. Happy birthday. Okay. Okay. Happy birthday. Okay. Bob. Thank you, Rima. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Rima. Wonderful book. Namaste.